So yeah, welcome everyone here. Uh, thanks for being here with us at the panel. Um, we live in a time where uh, we basically have access to all information we need almost instantly. Um, and therefore, one might ask uh, what role actually traditional institutions for education such as school or academia might play in the future and uh, the curricula, they said. Also, there are like new experimental forms of education coming up for learning and they're emerging for the younger but also for those who are like willing to uh, relearn and rethink themselves. But what are actually the skills that we need these days to cope with an ever-changing complex environment? And what are the traits that, for example, corporations and organizations should look for uh, in young leaders when they, in the end, actually end up working for those organizations? So I'm happy to explore a bit on those questions uh, with my panelists and maybe also the questions behind the question. So uh, guys, jump on, me, uh, jump on stage with me, please, and I am going to introduce you. And we had to do a slight change as Ramin, in the end, uh, is not going to, uh, it's not going to make it because he's in a traffic jam right now, it seems. Uh, but I think we're doing just fine. We are having more time each. So to my left, I have Patricia. Those who have been here like from the starting of the track uh, might have heard her uh, speaking. She's a researcher and an entrepreneur uh, based in the US. Um, 10 years of experience in academia. Uh, she even has been called like the rising star of uh, social psychology. Um, but she also founded uh, Self Hackathon, which is a series of events uh, to hack the most untapped resource we have on the planet, as you just said. Um, to her left, we have uh, Jeremy Lemry, who is a CEO and founder of Monkey Tie, which is a job platform slightly different because instead of just looking at CVs and looking at salaries, what they try is basically to match the applicant's personality with a fitting corporate culture. He also teaches on, um, on human resources in the digital age. So please give a, a round of applause for the two panelists on my side. Um, so maybe to start with, um, could you let us know uh, what made you actually join the panel? So what are actually um, your questions, your uh, solutions, or your experiences that link to that topic that made you say, well, yes, I think that would be an interesting to topic to talk about. Very briefly, maybe two tweet size or three. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, just like you said, I founded Monkey Tai based on the fact that Nowadays, recruiting people based on the, on the skills, on the technical skills, is really poor. It's a really poor approach. Just because um, performance and fit are not made by technical skills. They are made by personality. They are made by what we call the cognitive approach. And uh, that's where recruitment has to go, because that's where education has to go as well. And I think this is very important today to link uh, education, to link uh, job, like all the, um, all, all the yeah, job approach, well, what's, what's in it, how you recruit people, or how you develop people, how you make people move from one job to, other, to another. And um, today, these two worlds are not really well connected. At least they are not in France, although they are much more and more in the US, for example. Great. Um, thank you. So I, I share a personal story, maybe, um, because this is how I got into what we do now. Um, in 2008, 2009, I was working on Wall Street, as some of you might remember. That was the midst of the economical crisis in the U.S. Everything was just really going down. Um, and I remember I had a meeting with this girl. Um, I was doing some kind of um, mentoring for little girls. And, uh, and I asked this girl because I knew she was from Harvard Business School and uh, also MIT. Ridiculous CV. And I said, oh, do you want to come and mentor with me? And she said, um, she said, no. I said, why? And she says, um, there's nothing I can teach them. And um, to me, that was an aha moment that people, um, despite the pedigrees, this is really where the, where the game happens, is the mind space. Um, and funny enough, the second people learned, I'm a psychologist. My background was in psychology. 
everybody wanted to take me out for a coffee. And first I was like, oh, this is great. But then it turned out people want to talk about their own stuff because there's no space really. Um, no, few people want to go to psychologists, um, but there was really no space to talk about you know, the shame that people feel and uh, the low self-esteem, that the marital stuff, the intimacy issues that they have, the dating in New York City. Um, and so that's really, um, the big aha was that, we, yes, we have this formal education, but there's really no place. Nobody teaches us how to talk to people. Nobody teaches us how to be intimate with others or how to deal with failures. And that's really, um, that was the missing piece I've been seeing, even as a psychologist, within the, the, old, um, you know, the old walls of academia. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Thank you, guys. Um, so with your experience in understanding people's minds and also working in academia for more than 10 years and your experience maybe working with people who are actually still going to universities, what do you think um, with the alternatives models or alternatives models of education and learning coming up these days, maybe also enabled by digitalization, for example, do you think in the future people still want to do diplomas, still want to go to university, do like a standard career? Or do you think that academias will disappear in the near future? I think it's not really about what um, people want to do. It's about what has to be done. Um, taking my, my own example, I'm, uh, I'm a physicist. I'm, uh, I'm doing HR now, but I used to study quantum physics. And then I, study commu I studied communication. And eventually I worked as a financial analyst in, in a private equity fund. And then I quit and then I created my first startup and uh, monkey tie. And because I just, I, I could just see that monkey tie is, uh, is a concept that is like, um, is really important to me, but it's only a piece of something. Then I had to connect with competitors, with other players uh, of the market to, to have more importance, not just to be a successful company, but to have an impact on society. And then I created a second startup that is called the HR Lab. And that connects 150 French startups that, um, that actually do HR another way. I do what we call affinity HR, affinity recruitment. We, we use um, personality into recruitment. And some of the startups just do networking. Some others uh, have a platform based on challenges. And there are like so many concepts nowadays. And what, what we did is that we connected together 150 startups that are competitors. And we are working together and to, uh, to make change the government. We, we worked on, uh, recently on, um, on the best part of um, la, loi du tra uh, sur la loi travail, uh, not the part that everyone is protesting against, but the part that uh, is called the CPA, Compte Personnel d'Activité, that is building a, a, a new way for people to use their rights, their rights to, um, their rights to train, to learn. And um, based from that, we also moved, we also created a, an API, um, a, a data connection for every startup to connect and then to be able to play with the, with the corporates, with the large companies, because before that they were not able to. And that's what we call competitive collaboration or co-opetition. And I think nowadays that's what has to be done between people because problems are going really too fast, are really too complex to be solved by a single person. People have to work together, and they, they have to cooperate, they have to communicate, but also they have to be very creative, and they have to, like, they have to be able to find ideas, but also be able to select among these ideas which ones are the most powerful, which, uh, which are the most relevant, and that's critical thinking. So they have to develop all the skills that you never get to learn uh, at school, and that's what has to be done for the education system, and that what actually describes performance at work. So this is rather a no but than a yes and to my question, right? Um, so as somebody who spent many, many years in academia, um, I don't think the system is going away to start with. Um, I think there's, um, there's merit to having education and, and having European education going to US. I have to tell you, I have extra points for knowing history that the students in America never learn. And so I, I actually, uh, I would be in defense of, of, of the traditional system up to a point. Um, I think there is merit in learning how to be focused and um, learning how to study, but most importantly, learning how to think. And in some way, unfortunately, I think that's what we have lost in a way. 
because um, that really what school was about is learning how to think, right? And then learning how to learn, which is a meta skill. I would say uh, what to think. What to think, okay, yeah, unfortunately, yes. Um, so um, my w go away from academia was actually related to the fact that um, we, we climbed this into this ivory tower and we barely ever went down to the people. And, and I, I found that problematic because I think um, we exist, we do research for people and then just writing academic papers and you know, maybe three people in the world learned my papers and actually understood what the hell they were saying. Um, and as you know, the topic is pretty important. I mean, self-esteem, that's like, most of us deal with that. And so I think I could, it's, it's shifting. It has to shift. Um, soft skills have to be taught, have to be explored. Um, I think big revolution is coming with, uh, with the technology. Um, we have been playing around, some of you might know Udemy, there's a lot of um, platforms. However, those platforms, the retention rate is very low. The dropout rate is about 90 to 95% people. It, our attention spans are so, so short. People don't, you know, nobody can sit and learn for two hours. And so um, that system has to change. And I think that's really where personalized education is coming in. Um, understanding where people are, where they want to go, and give them exactly the curricula that they need to get that custom mailer, tailor for them. That's kind of a little bit what we're playing with, um, with great success. Um, and, um, yeah. You, yeah. Thank know. you. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned something really important, I think, which was, like, soft skills. And you said something about, like, learning how to think, actually. Um, would you both agree that we actually have to redefine what education really means? And uh, do you see like there's a difference between like learning and education? Like uh, I remember a friend, Albert, who must be around here, he was saying like education is something you do to people and learning is something you do with people. So what do you think about that? Uh, I think you, you're totally right. I mean, you, we have to redefine what students are taught at school because I really think that now and particularly like in France I don't really know how it, uh, how it is in the US but I know about this K-12 school system that I think really really powerful but in France you you're taught what to think and um, because you're, you're taught about like metrics about models about all the things but the thing is that our society is really going faster and faster and becoming more and more complex and models don't apply anymore. So you have to be really creative uh, about um, what, what happens. And you have to be able to, at a given moment, to analyze the situation and explore new possibilities that you won't find in books. And that's, that's why uh, education has to, has to teach this, uh, this, type of, uh, of this type of thinking. And it's basically, let's say, problem solving problem solving and project management but it's like you we have to, we live in a period where it's about uh, how we say permanent problem solving and that's that's what schools have to try to develop in every children can i um so i i flew him from another conference and it was a transhumanist conference um how many how many of you are familiar with the concept of living forever <laughs> pretty much um and I actually, it was a little talk, and then my summary was something I just came up with uh, at a shower, of course. And um, the Moore's Law actually says, and they just suspended it, but for the longest time it was, you know, the computational power of machine was, was doubling every 18 months. Um, maybe it won't be 18 months, maybe it will be four years, it doesn't matter, but information is speed, everything is speeding up around us. Um, there's, we're being flooded with information, and honestly, from my perspective as a psychologist, um, the solution to that, the more everything spins around us, the more we have to go back to the very, very ancient wisdom, which is know thyself. And uh, which means, who am I? What do I want in this life? What's my purpose? How do I learn? What do I want? What's my wiring? How can I rewire myself? And so it really goes back to those skills that are very, very fundamental that I know you guys are also teaching with those children. It's like, who are you, right? Um, independently of this swirling world around us. Yeah, thanks for making the yeah. transition, actually, because sure. I really would like to welcome Ramin Farangi also on stage. Thanks for making it. Um, so maybe quickly just to introduce you, um, Ramin, uh, Ramin actually had a perfect straight line career because he was very good at school, went to university, worked as a consultant then at Boston Consulting Group, but then decided uh, to become a teacher, a math and physics teacher uh, at high school. 
But in the end, you decided to open your own school, which is Ecole Dynamique, which is basically a democratic school where kids are basically allowed to do what they want during their time there because there's no curricula and no timetables at all, right? Yeah, that's how it is. And first of all, well, I'm very sorry to be late and thanks for being so kind with me <laughs> being like unacceptably late. Um, yeah, I just came back actually from a meeting with uh, the number two of the Ministry of Education and it took a uh, longer time than what I thought. And it was actually to discuss about the recognition of the alternative education movements in, in France and uh, yeah, about conditions of, of how to open private schools in France. So, yeah, that doesn't give me any excuse, actually. It doesn't give, make me any more important. But so the I, first question yeah. I asked uh, both of them, actually, was, like, um, why they, in the end, decided to uh, join me on the panel here. So what are, like, the really the deep questions they, like, moved about in terms of educational learning for the future? So briefly, what would you ask, uh, answer to that? So briefly, my question is, okay, we're, we have this big kind of almost spiritual debate going on about do we want to live in a society that's based on competition or cooperation. I think we all have that pretty much in mind now. And in what kind of context would we like to uh, have our kids grow up so that tomorrow's society is an actual society of collaboration and cooperation? I mean, society is simultaneously the mother and the child of its own education system. So if children grow up in a context where you cooperate, where you solve problems together, there's strong chances that as adults, they'll just keep doing this and they won't be competing for points on some kind of exam anymore. Um, so yeah, that's, th th that's the deal. In, in our school, we're a democratic community of uh, people. We considered every single person, regardless of age, as a competent, mature person from four years old up. And we're all mixed in ages. Um, and yeah, it's a context where the four-year-old and the 44-year-old are all free to live their own lives. And living together in a common space is complicated, so we run into a whole bunch of issues. And democratically solving all these issues together is the key component of, a, of the learning experience in this kind of school. So it's very revolutionary. Thank you. Um, so you, you were already mentioning like one of the main skills uh, maybe needed for now, which is like problem solving. And we basically should teach that. But what is actually the role of the teacher these days, where basically we can uh, look up information everywhere in, on the internet. So is it still like an educator that's needed, or should we rather call it a facilitator maybe in the future? I, I think Patricia raised a really important point, uh, which is about like personal development of children. And in education, in basically in learning, we have two, two aspects. The first one is like transmission of information. And today, with internet, and which means like a lot of information and people being networked all the time, transmission of information basically goes to zero. It's like, it's like zero cost. And knowledge is everywhere. So teachers, if they, if they are just here to like transmit knowledge, they're useless. But the second part in learning is like um, the way you make children assimilate knowledge and the way you accompany them for like for to make this knowledge a source of development, to make them grow, actually, and not only know. And that's the thing. Teachers have to make children grow and not know. And so teachers have to be like growers. They have to be kind of psychologists in a way, but not, not only. They have to, let's take um, primary school, for example. They have to, of course, they have to have like a basic knowledge of every, in every field, uh, enough to be able to uh, exchange to, to have a conversation with the children. But I mean, that's not the main skills they should have. They, they should be able to, like a coach, they should be able to, to, train, to train people, to grow their, um, their personality strengths, and to grow their ability to work with each other. So they have to be like project managers. Would you second on that, or how you make, uh, how you develop like a concept of growth for the mm -hmm. children? So I'll answer to you with a question, Jeremy. What if, uh, in fact, the thing that enables children to transform information into knowledge and in knowledge into wisdom and self-development, uh, what if just setting up some kind of context could enable that completely and not have anyone with the sticker teacher on his face have the specific role of doing 
doing this in a kind of forced, artificial, kind of intentional way? What if it could all happen by itself, but by working on the context you offer, somehow uh, offering something that's rich enough and stimulating enough without intentionally doing things on kids? Like, don't you think it's possible? I totally agree with you, and that, that's, that was actually my point. Maybe I did not express it well, but take, take the example of 42, the program in school. They don't have teachers, but they do have coordinators. I think Patricia wants to say something as well. I'm not sure if Buddha said that, but somebody said it. Um, they said, when you find Buddha, kill Buddha. Um, and that means when you find the, the teacher, you actually have to kill the teacher in a way. Um, not physically, um, but you eventually surpass the teacher, and the teacher, you become your own teacher. And uh, as somebody who um, uh, has had many, many teachers, and there was always an advisor to go to, there was always a boss to go to and get a pat in the back, at some points you literally have to say, um, you, you have to kill them. And, and some of, for some of us, they're, they're, they're almost father figures or parental figures. Um, I think that shift starts happening around 28, 29 psychologically for a lot of people. Um, some of you might be that age, you might be going through life changes, that's normal actually. Um, when you look at kind of the Jungian psychology, that's really where the pendulum swings. And that's really the second win for lifelong education because you, there's no more gods, there's no more father figures that tell us what to do. For a lot of people, that's, they don't know what to do in the space where we have all this freedom to actually be who we are and, and be fully grounded. Um, so people run back and you know, try to find the answers in culture, religion, whatever. They actually say, you know, this famous book, Escape from Freedom by, by Eric Fromm, who actually says, we're so afraid of that freedom that we, we push back and we, we go back into religion and we go back to culture and we go and look, start looking for those mentors. Um, what if you were to be your own mentor? And, 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 and I think after 30s, that's really, is the, that's really is the space to go and explore that. And, and that's where I get excited to explore with people because this is, the learning actually just starts there. It starts once you leave the school. I don't know Thank if that answers your question, but um, I just want to say that. <laughs> I still have uh, like some really interesting questions here. I would be eager to hear your answers too, but I was told I should leave some time, of course, to, for the audience to also ask, because I'm sure there are some pretty in interesting questions uh, I would like to hear. So uh, feel free to uh, raise your questions to Patricia, Jeremy, and uh, Ramin. There's one in the middle. So you, Patricia, said that we like start learning when we, when when we finish school or university. In my case, like I experienced that when I finished all the formal education, my brain started like to like work, and I wonder if that's possible, like before you finish all this formal education today. I don't know. I I, I guess you have to be like really open-minded. I don't know what you think about that. Is, is, that that's, is that a question for me? Oh, okay. Anybody? Uh, maybe you answer. I need time to th I'm introverted, so actually when you ask me a question, I need time to think about it. So I prefer somebody else to answer, and then I think about it. Uh, it's funny because I'm doing a TED Talk tomorrow, and that's one of the things I'm exactly saying, that it, I feel that I started to learn truly essential things after age 23 when I got out of school. and had a direct experience with the real world. And this is because we still have the worldview that there needs to be a preparation phase for the real world. So the whole question is, during a formal education, is it possible? Yeah, but we do need to revolutionize the formal education to, so that it looks like something that is much closer to the real world. I mean, in the real world, we don't see people lined up behind desks uh, doing something that people have been doing for ages and that no one needs, right? I mean, this is just not how the world works. People collaborate on projects that are useful to people, they create value, they harvest ideas around them all the time, they interact with people from all generations and backgrounds. You, you don't see like a room full of 34-year-olds because they're 34. I mean, that's just completely... When you take just a, even a quick step back from what we're doing and what conventional education looks like, I mean, I think it's not that hard to see how insane it is, really. I mean, it's, a, it's an experience that has been running for 150 years or 200 years or something, and I think we can now declare this experiment, uh, I mean, obsolete and... Uh, you know, with 25% of people unemployed in France today, 
coming out of uh, college, we clearly have to need to re-question what education, I mean, the, the goal of education, what is it for? I mean, is it to produce effective uh, people who can uh, live in this society, in today's society, with a collaborative economy and everything growing? Or, yeah, do we keep going, going with 19th century stuff and, I don't know, keep going on with something that clearly seems like it's not working anymore? I probably won't answer your question, but um, I want to share something else that, in a way, answers your question. Um, I think, um, yes, it's possible. And um, this is a metaphor. I, I believe life, in a way, lives at breadcrumbs. You know, the story of whatever their name were. And they were in breadcrumbs, and they went follow, chasing it, and they eventually found their way. Um, those breadcrumbs are our curiosities. And uh, unfortunately, uh, even in my case, I was bit on the head for having, you know, being too curious about too many things. But f I think the interesting thing is to follow where the energy goes. Every time we strike something that's really, that's really ours, the energy really goes up and we get excited. Um, and that's, in many places, it's called ADHD. Um, but in reality, it's, it's the interest speaking up because the nervous system gets excited. It's, it's normal, right? And I think it's oh, what I see. It, I don't know how it is in Europe, but over medicalized children, children getting um, ADHD, um, Ritalin, and other all um, drugs at age of seven, eight, uh, which is pretty common in the US, um, I think we're doing huge harm um, to the generation that actually could be doing many things with their extremely malleable minds at that time. Um, but be curious. I mean, it's amazing how much education kills curiosity. I remember I was, I was already a PhD student, and I had all those um, lines of research because I was, looking at, um, I was looking at genocide and metaphors. And so I had to draw uh, between his, uh, parallels between history, biology, neurology, all those things. And my advisor came over, and he said, you have to focus on one topic. And I'm like, but I'm focused on one topic. It's just the topic is so big. And he said, no, you won't go anywhere in academia if you don't put your head down and just write about one topic. And so that was my bing bing ring the bell. This is not, uh, this is not for me. Uh, but there were many people who stayed. And I think also academia, and I can only speak from that perspective, it, people get trapped. If, after you spend many years in academia, all you can do is stay in the system because that's all you know how to do. So I left academia at what? I was 26 for the first time. And I was like, nobody's going to hire me. I have no useful skills except for writing academic papers and analyzing data. Um, it's, it's pretty sad. So, yeah. That probably didn't answer your question, but I hope it was at least interesting. <laughs> yeah. If I remember right, it was the story of Hansel Gretel, by the way, and uh, Wikipedia just proved me right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Further questions? Uh, yes, here. Uh, this is a question for Ramin. I was wondering regarding the echol dynamic. So you solve issues with um, a democratic process, right? So you ask people, and I'm sure you learn a lot during this process, but does the outcome is always positive in the sense that is everyone is saying, for example, the sky is red, does, does that mean that the sky is red? You know what I mean? That sometimes the crowd is going to, or the democracy is not going to give the real, so the real answer to this, uh, to the question. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. And actually, not only that, you could, uh, in a democratic school, you could, you could have not only uh, nonsensical and just false things being uh, transferred, but even in terms of like uh, creating a peaceful and safe climate, I mean, if you could use democratic procedures just like written as on paper as how a democratic school works and still create a living hell on earth. So, of course, the goal is to create a paradise where people grow and develop and, you know, become uh, uh, and grow both in knowledge and in spirit and in everything. Uh, and clearly there is a big dependence on the adults. I mean, the adults who are the founders of the school and who take care of the school, who nurture the school. Uh, I mean, they are the most experienced people there, and there's a natural transmission of uh, experience that happens without even us really wanting it, just by being ourselves and working on ourselves. Uh, I mean, children just, I mean, you, you kind of see the, the, the effect. And in the end, I, I guess that, yeah, you have to trust democracy. You have to trust that in the end, collective intelligence always grows towards better decisions, better wisdom. Um, I think the process 
of democracy is clearly more effective into growing towards a better de decision, even though there's this um, risk you're talking about that is clearly true, and you know people voted for Hitler, so that's you know that, that's clearly a, uh, a risk. And th this is why the whole philosophy is really based on personal responsibility. I mean, democ democracy is not about electing someone that directs you; it's about really making your own choices and living with the consequence of, of these choices. So it really there's really a whole process making you conscious that democracy happens with every little thing you do in life, really. I mean, what vehicle you drive, where you live in, what food you eat, what bank you put your money into. I mean, everything you think, say, and do is basically a certain vote for a certain kind of society. Uh, and, you know, that's what democracy means to me. And I think this, it is this kind of value that is naturally getting transferred into our school's atmosphere. Um, I, actually, I do have an example that is very relevant to, to your question. Um, I founded the, the HR Lab, and we are gathering 150 startups that are actually competing with each other. And we decided to, um, to move, to shift towards a shared governance, which means that um, everyone is virtually able to make decisions. But how we did that? Because when it's about business, like many of the people just want to do business. They will look for the inter, um, individual interest. So how do you make people work for the collective interest where they want um, first to prioritize their individual interest? So we created what we call the sharing ratio. And basically, every, um, for example, as a startup, you're trying to sell something to, to a corporate, to a company, and it happens much more often that you actually don't sell your stuff, that you sell your stuff. So let's say 90% of the time you don't sell, but you actually got to exchange with someone in the company and actually got to know about something he needs, but that you cannot answer. And then if you get back this need and share it with the community, then you will earn sharing points. And when you take a service from the HR lab, for example, accessing this database of, um, of prospects of potential clients, then it costs you some sharing points. And actually, this, this gives, like all the services you take and the services you share, it gives your, uh, your sharing ratio. And uh, your ability to decide within the HR lab is decided um, depending on your sharing ratio. The higher your ratio is, the more, the more like, decision power you have in the association. OK. So education maybe as a commodity. Um, I think it's a good remark maybe to think about. Unfortunately, the time is already over. We have to, we're already running a bit late. One more question? Okay, thanks a lot. And I think we have one question here. Uh, maybe not exactly short, but um, I was wondering, because we've been talking about different ways of education, um, but in reality, the system right now looks very different. What would be, and like the system is not going to change radically, what would be like small changes you would implement to improve learning of uh, children of high school? Of, um, you. you want to answer? Yes. Yeah, One sure. tweet. Two um, tweets. So, th three things probably. Um, and they were actually on one of my slides um, grit, resilience, and self esteem. And um, I think those are skills that are absolutely fundamental and ability to actually connect with another human being. We know now that uh, technology, unfortunately, ki kills empathy. Um, we don't really know how to interact with each other. And we know also that we're wired to be social. Um, at any point in time, 40% of this population feels lonely. So probably 40% of us feel lonely, although they're in the crowd, because we don't know how to reach out to people and, and how to connect. Um, I would say those three and... Um, you know, and sky is the limit. I would say one thing, make them work together ag instead of against each other. Make them collaborate and stop making them compete. I mean, it is, it is a revolution, but it can happen at a very small level as well. I mean, a, a teacher in a class can go like, okay, now let's do problems on which you actually work together and you don't do your thing on your own where you're trying to get the best grade and do better than your neighbor. I think that's pretty easy to do, actually. Yeah. Clearly, get rid of grades, and that's easy, and people are doing it all over France already, even, even. There are experiments like this, yeah. <laughs>